Kia ora, Kiwi Kodja here and welcome to episode 50, entitled The Battle of the Causeway Part 1. Now, most of the previous episodes have been about Hongihika, Te Rao Paraha and Te Whero Whero, but of course, in 1822, there were many tribes seeking Utu for one cause or another. In this episode, I'll introduce two new chiefs that are still highly celebrated by their iwi to this day. The first is Mananui Tehuhu, sometimes referred to as Tehuhu the Second. He is the second of the Tehuhu line that continues to this very day with Sir Tumu Tehuhu the Eighth. In 1822, Mananui is the paramount chief, the Oriki of the Nati Tuwharoto, based at his pa Waitahanui, which is here. The Rohe covers this area here. The second is Tapara Ihe of the large Kahununu Iwi. He is the chief of the Fatui Apati Hapu, and through many feats and wise decision, plays a similar role to Moses in leading his people away from danger and into the wilderness. In this case, the wilderness is the Mahia Peninsula. His people will stay there for 20 years before returning to the Hiraitonga. The Kahuunu Rohe covers this large area, but the Hapu of Fatui Apati is more this area here. Now, in 1820, Te Paraihe's pa is on a small island at Lake Roto Atara in the Hiratonga, a truly formidable pa. In the same year, 1820, Mananui Tehuhu invades the Hiratonga and lays siege to the Roto Atara pa. Without sufficient canoes to carry warriors to the island, it's a hopeless task. The defenders have a good supply of water, the lake, stores of kumara and potato, supplemented by the abundance of eels in the lake. In fact, the defenders are usually better fed than the besiegers. A major portion of Tehuhu's force realises the futility of the siege and leave to attack another pa at Waimarama. They are defeated and return to Roto Atara. Tehuhu lifts the siege and takes his remaining force back to Waimarama. This time they are successful and they take the pa with great slaughter. He then returns to Topo to lick his wounds and let the scorn of the Rotoatara defenders fester. Two years go by. It is now late in 1822. Tehuhu wishes to try again, but now with a plan for success. He sends invitations to Nati Rokawa, Nati Maniapoto, Waikato, and Nati Maru to join him. They all agree. Staying with Nati Maru at this time is a contingent of Korokoro's hapu of Napui that have good relations with Nati Maru. The combined force is not known, but I'd guess it'd be well over 1,000. They leave Waitahanui Pa November or December 1822. In the historical record, there is no mention of muskets, which seems strange. Waikato were in possession of around 160 from the army of Whenua, Matakitaki and Hui Putea. The Napui contingent are guaranteed to have some. I think we can assume that muskets were present, and let's say that the invaders had maybe 10. But probably as important as the muskets are the steel axes and tomahawks that the invaders have, as we shall see. The route taken is roughly as shown, coming uh, down the Ruahine Ranges, crossing them, coming out at Waipawa, then north to Roto Atara. Tehuhu hopes this route may surprise Nati Fatui Apati and they can capture some of their canoes. 
Since Te Hu Hu's departure in 1820, Te Para Ihe has been strengthening his power in anticipation of the inevitable return. He keeps the power in a state of readiness, stocked well with food for a lengthy siege. He stations small kainga around the likely routes to Hu Hu may take and equips them with a hollow trunk gong that can be heard at Roto Atara. The southerly kainga serves its purpose well. The distant gong is heard quite distinctly and its direction ascertained. The dreaded day is at hand. Roto Atara sounds its gong to warn the kainga to the west, east and north. Those from the west and east stream back and are canoed to the island. Te Paraihe is concerned for the northern kainga. It's the furthest and has the least amount of notice. Those from the north start arriving and canoes begin their shuttle service. On their return, they look to the west and see the invaders making their way around the lake. No longer in stealth mode, they fire off their muskets, start chanting and break into a trot. Some canoes load those already there and set off. The empty ones wait for the expected influx. They see a strung out group racing towards them. When a canoe is full, it launches. Now the last canoe leaves. Those left and still coming wade into the mud and reeds, then plunge into the water and swim. The pursuers close in. Many are caught and dragged back to land. As to Hu Hu's army grows on the northern bank, the captured are tortured, their screams clearly audible to all. When the tail of Hu Hu's army arrives, the screaming finally stops, their heads now on spears for those on the par to see. The Hu Hu addresses his army from the shore. His words are lost to those on the par straining to get a view. Hu Hu turns to the pa, and as one, the army makes the water ripple with a thunderous haka. As many as can exit the pa onto the little land that separates it from the water. The rest form up inside. Te Paraihe addresses his people from a parapet in sight of all. The invaders cannot hear his words, but everyone hears the ancient haka of the Nati Kahu Nunu. At the end, muskets are fired from the shore with no effect. Those on the island bear their backsides to the enemy. Raucous insults are shouted by both sides. The 350 metres separating them makes everything faint and ineffectual. It peters out fast. It is late afternoon and the army begins working on a camp they'll occupy for some time. In the par, the arrivals are assigned places. Those who can have not made it are comforted. Canoes are dragged in through the rear of the par. The layout of the par is made ready for the coming siege and defence. The last two months have been wet. But this month has been very hot and dry. Capturing canoes would have been a bonus, but Hugh Hugh's main plan is to build a causeway to the island pa, then storm it. It has been long in the planning. On his return in 1820, he tasked his carvers and builders with the engineering of a causeway. Design and trials were completed in the swamps at the back of the Waitahanui Pa. All the equipment and logistics for the task are now on the shore of Roto Otara, ready to go. The carvers and builders have been training others. A large contingent of women have come to make the rope and lattice the pathways. Everyone is looking forward to the weeks ahead. Te Paraihe is curious as to Hu Hu's strategy. He knows he wouldn't have come unless victory was obtainable. 
the paraiye feels safe, but has a knot in his stomach. On that first night, the smell of cooked flesh drifts across the lake. A usually anticipated smell, but not when you know it's your kin. It's a potent reminder as to what'll happen if the pa falls. Next day, the pa observes little activity from the invaders' camp. Canoes are launched to survey the shore for possible clues. Reports advise to Paraihe that trees are being felled in the Te Ote forest. This continues for the next two days. Te Paraihe wonders if they are going to build a pa and use it as a base to colonise his territory. A rather worrying prospect with his hapu having no muskets. On the third day, logs are seen being dragged into Te Hiu-Hiu's camp, worked on, then stacked. The area where they are camping is a poor site for a pa. Te Paraihe is baffled. On day four, he sees in the distance some structure leading from the land into the swampy edge of the lake. After another day, it's apparent what's happening. They are building a causeway. Te Paraihe is impressed. Te Hiu has not disappointed him. Te Paraihe calls a meeting of chiefs. They all admire Te Hiu's plan. It's agreed to wait and observe and look for counter-strategies. For the next week, progress is monitored. Canoes are sent to report on its construction. They learn very quickly to stay out of musket range. Its design is beautiful in its simplicity. We have a description from Henderson in his book, Maori History of Hawke's Bay, page 22. So let's read that out. This causeway was constructed by driving stakes into the lake bed in pairs, crossing each other at an angle and so making a long line of V's. Into these V's, brushwood was packed longitudinally and on top of the brushwood a path was built. So here's my interpretation of what Henderson has written. There's a bit of background. Uh, Cowrie logs are the only native timber that float. So this causeway would have been made out of probably Kakata. Anyway, uh, we have this construction and a man at the bottom there to give you some idea. Let's go to the next slide. This shows a water depth of around three and a half to four meters. Um, and when they talk about the V's, they talked about, uh, Henderson talked about putting uh, brushwood into the V's and then putting these uh, pathways that the uh, I presume the women will have weaved together and placed on top. So in this gap here on this third slide, in that hollow section I'm pointing to, will have been where the brushwood would have gone. But you can see from this that the um, causeway is only two people wide. I don't believe the uh, timbers were driven into the seabed, I, into the lake bed. I, I can't see any what mechanism for doing that. I believe they would have been taken out and lifted up and the timbers would have slowly sunken into the bottom of the lake. Uh, of course, all this, I don't show any binding, but everything would have been held together by rope uh, and I think this construction would have been moderately easy. Right, back to the story. They have made 50 metres of causeway in seven days. As they get closer, it'll be slower, but all things considered, and if they can negotiate the deep sections, it'll take over two months to reach the island. For to hear here, it's a matter of keeping his army fed and in good spirits. For te paraihe, it's how to stop the causeway. Okay, folks, that's where this one will finish. I'll put links below to my sources, and at the end of episode 51, the next episode, I'll give what is in the historical record. So, take it easy. 
Stay safe out there. Hi, Connor. Catch you later.